Y'all like to hear a story today? Well, did you ever have one of those times when you were, everything in, in your logical mind told you that this was a bad idea, but you went ahead and did it anyway? Well, there's just something that tells you you got to do it, right? Well, I found myself one day in the early 1980s contemplating that very point. I was uh, shivering in the back of an ancient rattletrap snowcat. See, we were making our way up a canyon outside of Salt Lake City. And we were doing this in the teeth of a raging snowstorm and the pitch black of night. And me, I was feeling dejected because everything I knew told me this was not only a monumental waste of time, but it was downright dangerous. But there was just something in the back of my mind that told me I had to be there. I guess you could say it had started earlier that day when I got a call from Dave Madsen. He was my squadron commander. You see, back in those days, I was a volunteer search and rescue pilot with the Civil Air Patrol. Search and rescue, that's kind of, that kind of a misnomer. Uh, makes it sound very exciting and important, much more so than what we actually did. See, mostly we went out on false alarms, you know, not much to that. And then if, uh, if a small airplane really did go down in those mountains of Utah, there just, uh, there, there wasn't anyone to rescue. There were really just bodies to locate so they could be recovered for the families. Well, see, Dave, he called me that Saturday afternoon. He said, we've got a red cap. Now, that means we've got a live search mission. This is no drill. Seems like an old Cherokee 140 had gone down and it was believed to be in the mountains just outside of Salt Lake. Well, Dave and I both knew that because the weather was so bad that day, there wasn't any way we could launch an aerial search, maybe Sunday, the next day at the earliest. But Dave, he's one of those innovator types. You know, and there is nothing more troublesome than a guy like that armed with a new idea. <laughs> And so his idea was to put me in the back of this old snowcat, creeping up the side of a mountain all night long in the dark in the snowstorm. That was his great idea. The hope was that he could get a ground team into the most likely search area by dawn so that we could get a little faster to the crash site. That's as if we actually found it. Well, that was the plan. But see, I was a pilot, remember? Volunteer pilot. I'm no ground pounder. I didn't sign up for this kind of stuff. Usually it was the local sheriff that did anything on the ground during one of our searches. But see, Dave, he'd already been turned down by the sheriff. It was too long of odds and too risky. And the sheriff was right. It was a stupid plan. I mean, think about it. We only had the vaguest idea of where we ought to even start searching. Odds were high that we'd put that cat in the wrong place, we'd put it in the wrong canyon. Heck, most likely we were going to put it in the wrong mountain range altogether. And then given the piece of junk that the highway department was loaning us and the weather, we weren't likely to get very far from the road, so maybe it didn't matter where we put the cat. Well, if we did get off the road, odds were we were going to be the ones needing rescue before dawn came. <laughs> and if by some miracle all this stuff worked out, you know, really all we were going to gain for all this risk, maybe 10, 12 hours head start on recovering those frozen body sickles. That's really about it. So it was a stupid plan. It was a pointless gesture. Dave knew it was a stupid plan. He knew I wouldn't like it and wouldn't sign on for it. So before I could start detailing to him all the flaws in this plan, he played his whole card. He said, the guy in the Cherokee is Tommy Weed. That stopped me cold. You see, at the time, my day job was as a flight instructor. And Tommy Weed had been one of my students. My most aggravating student by far. <laughs> see, it didn't matter how hard I tried. With him, the lessons just never seemed to sink in. So eventually, I told him he had to get another instructor. I stopped flying with him. I, I turned my back on him. And it occurred to me that day that I could not turn my back on him again. So no matter how pointless Dave's plan was, how foolish it was, I knew I had to go. 
Call it guilt if you want, but I didn't have a choice. I had to go. So that's how I found myself in the back of that old rattle trap, creeping up the side of the canyon, immigration canyon just outside of Salt Lake. We're doing this in the raging snowstorm in the pitch black of night. And by the way, that old cat, it didn't have any heat and the exhaust leaked. <laughs> so I sat there in the back of that cat trying to take bets with myself. Would I succumb first to asphyxiation or hypothermia? And I was feeling mighty dejected. And if sucking diesel fumes and slowly freezing to death was not enough, we would have to stop that cat every 30 minutes. You see, we had George with us, and George, he had a, a homemade courtesy of Radio Shack ELT receiver. That's emergency locator transmitter. And so there was a small chance that with his equipment, we could receive a signal from the crash. But you had to be in just the right place. And see, that equipment wouldn't work inside the cat. So every 30 minutes, we would stop. George would reach for that door, and bam, the wind would take it, banging against the side, and it would come knifing through that cab and through your bone down to the marrow. That cold was so bad. I can feel it to this very day. So we'd trudge out a few yards away from the snow cat, and with numb fingers, we'd try to put together his equipment, and he'd listen. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing, 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 a whole lot of nothing. Come one o'clock in the morning, we've been doing this for five hours. And I am feeling mighty frustrated with this whole thing. What a waste of time. And George is over there listening. He thinks maybe, maybe he heard something, but he's not sure. Another half hour, he did hear something. Another half hour. Starting to look like Dave Madsen may have guessed right where he sent us. And you know, the weather, it cleared too. The snow was gone, the wind was gone, clouds were gone. You know what that means in the mountains, right? It got colder. <laughs> we're down below zero at this point. It is cold, cold. Now, I was a volunteer pilot, pilot. <laughs> didn't sign up for this. I had never been closer to the carnage of a crash site than a thousand foot overhead going 80 mile an hour. And having cursed this mission all night long as being pointless, I was beginning to fear that we might be successful. And I would have to face what was at that crash site. Now old Mitch, he starts jumping around in the front of the cab. He starts saying something. He's squirming, squirming like a little kid up there. Can't hear anything he's saying over the noise. Cat goes on for another few minutes and then it stops. We all crane forward to try and look out the front. And there, just on the edge of our searchlight beam, is a crumpled Cherokee 140. We got to the crash site. Now, Cherokee 140 is a low wing four place airplane. And the wreckage had come to rest upright. That's a good thing. The wings were covered with snow because of the storm, but you could tell they had been mangled under that snow. The cabin, the cabin was still intact. That's a good thing. But it had been bent in the crash. And so the door was popped open and it was standing open and the snow had gathered inside the cabin. That's a bad thing. Well, we started to slog over to the wreckage and. Mitch, he was in the lead because he's an EMT. I was second. The original report had told us that there were two SOBs. That's souls on board. <laughs> and as we started to approach those bodies, I got to admit, I was getting pretty spooked. Well, Mitch, he climbs up on what's left of that wing root. He kneels down so that he can kind of get halfway into that cabin. I climb up on that wing root behind him. I'm standing right next to the rear passenger window. <laughs> I said the weather had calmed and that mountain night was silent as the tomb. Mitch, he whispers, I don't know, out of respect or something, this guy, he died instantly. That other one, he lived long enough to crawl into the back before he died. 
that poor bugger must have suffered. I take my light and I shine it through that rear window across that poor unfortunate who had suffered. It was Tommy. Oh, Tommy. And as my light went across his face, wait a minute, what? Then I hear, suffer hell, I'm still alive. He was alive. <laughs> well, we got him out of there, scared the bejesus out of me. I jumped right out of my skin, fell off that wing, and bang against what was left of the tail of that airplane. We got him out. We ministered him as best we could. They had to minister to me, too, at that point. <laughs> they would tell us later that if we had not been there, the cold would have taken him before anybody else could have got to him if they had found the crash site the next day. Well, a week later, I find myself in, the, uh, in a room with an investigator from the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB. See, they investigate any time there's a small airplane, any airplane that crashes. And the man, he asked me, do you know Tommy Wee? Well, I am not proud of that interview. Because you see, I was Tommy's primary instructor. So I'm feeling pretty defensive about my student having caused this crash and this death. So I came up with every criticism I could think of <coughs> of Tommy Weed, both as a pilot and a human being. I'm ashamed of that. And the man, he didn't write any of that down, though. And then he asked me, did you know the other guy? No. And he starts to pack up. He's getting ready to head out the door, and then he says, did you know the other guy's wrists were broken? No. He took a long look at me and said, you don't know what that means, do you? No, I didn't. He said, he was the one flying, not Tommy. Tommy's not the villain in this crash. You see, it turns out this other guy was a longtime friend of Tommy's. He was visiting from out of town just that weekend. He was a thousand hour Navy jet pilot. And he was bound and determined to go sightseeing that weekend and show off to his friend who had a new pilot's license. And they had witnesses confirm that Tommy actually tried to talk him out of the flight. Tommy said no. But see, Tommy was a new pilot. He couldn't explain, he couldn't articulate why they shouldn't go on this flight, but he knew they shouldn't. Well, his friend, his friend overruled him, pulled rank on him, and so they went on the flight anyway. And so the man, as he was getting ready to leave from that investigation room, he said, the only mistake Tommy made was he didn't have the confidence to follow his instincts. That struck me as pretty profound. You know, instinct, it's a funny thing. Sometimes it knows the right answer when you just can't explain it. And I have always been so thankful that we follow Dave Madsen's instinct to go on a stupid, pointless gesture of a plan that evening. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you.